So when we talk about uh, mischief in projects, uh, think about all of those little things that seem uh, unimportant at the time. They seem like small enough to kind of let slip, but over time, if they're not kept in check, uh, can actually create all kinds of havoc on your client site or your relationship with them. So when we talk about managing mischief, that's what we mean. And I don't know about you, but we've seen mischief come up in all kinds of different ways. And sometimes you can kind of feel helpless against mischief, that it's just a part of developing. It's just a part of working online, that you're going to have these unforeseen things pop up uh, on your sites and your client relationships. But we actually have a really good tool uh, that regardless of the source of the mischief, uh, can help us combat it, can help us manage that mischief. And that tool is clarity. And by it, by its definition, clarity is one of those tricky things because if something is unclear, it's unclear that it's unclear. It's hard to know what exactly is unclear and that we need more clarity in. But we'll go through a few different common sources of mischief in client projects and see how applying clarity or really thinking through clearly uh, helps us manage that mischief. And the first one uh, is client expectations. So we'll call this the, the forest of expectations. This is that dark place where all client expectations come from. And it's so key for us to have clarity in those expectations early and often. Now, one of the biggest ways that we do this is in email. Uh, most of your you know, communication back and forth with a client is going to be through email. Hopefully, you don't give them your cell phone number. Uh, or if you have, you've learned from it. But most of our interaction back and forth is going to be with email. Now, as developers, uh, it's not enough to write good code. You've got to learn on the business side to write a good email. So you've got to come with some kind of a strategy for how you're going to approach email. When somebody submits a bug request, when somebody comes in with some kind of uh, you know, feature that they want to add, something that's out of scope, how do you handle that? So it's key to have a response strategy. What is your email strategy when dealing with clients? And for us, we had a really specific one. So the problem that we were solving as a support company, uh, or at least as one of the things that we do is in support, uh, we had a, just a massive volume of requests that were coming in of all kinds of different levels of complexity. And it was taking two, three, six hours on average to get a response to them because we were falling into the trap that's super common of we see a problem with a client site, they write in, and you immediately go to fix that, right? I want to go make sure that this gets taken care of. And they don't hear from you for two, three, four, six hours because you're working trying to fix that. And the entire time, they're just sitting there clicking refresh thinking, like, is this fixed yet or not? They have no idea. So for us, we developed uh, something that worked for us in a strategy. Your strategy is going to be totally different. But one of the things that we devised is having an initial response that includes a few basic building blocks. So if you're a support client with us, you write in. Whenever uh, you get a response from us, it's going to be fairly quickly. Uh, we're going to let you know a few key things. We're going to acknowledge whatever that issue is. Uh, so yes, I was able to replicate this, or hey, I'm not able to replicate that. Uh, but then you're going to get a, a few kind of key things. Uh, the first one is what we need from you, right? Can you send me a screenshot? Can you refresh? Can you try in something other than Internet Explorer? Like, can you do something for me? What do I need from you? What I'm going to be doing, right? So uh, I'm going to be clearing the cache, resetting the permalinks, escalating this to somebody else. What I need from you, what I'm going to be doing, and when you can expect to hear back. And that last little piece is key, because just being able to say, you know, I need you to do this, I'm going to do this, and you can expect to hear back from me in an hour or by the end of the day. That keeps them from just sitting there hitting refresh and causing all kinds of mischief in that client relationship. And it can, the, now you notice we don't say you can expect this to be resolved in an hour, resolved by the end of the day. It may two, two, take two weeks because we're going to be, you know, pulling out a lot of just spaghetti at the end of this project. But letting them know you're going to hear from me by the end of the day with an update. Even if that update is, we're still working on it. But that update can include, I need something from you, this is what I'll be doing, and this is when you're going to hear from me again. And those simple things have done wonders for us and support. And because it's so simple, anybody in an organization, regardless of their skill set with WordPress, can give that response very quickly. Uh, the next thing is really accounting for all of the, th all of the things that go into it. Uh, it it's easy to uh, look at an issue, look at a request, and think about the code that needs to be written. To think, okay, this is going to take me two hours to do, right? And so when we're writing that initial response, you usually can think, well, it's going to take me about two hours to do. You're going to hear back from me in two or three hours. But how many of you know when you have multiple projects that you're running, two hours of code time, especially if you're working on a remote team and there's other people, you'd never really have that two-hour block, right? Two hours of coding takes about a week, right? 
right? To, to really have that focus time to get onto it. So accounting for those things uh, on the front end help mitigate that mischief. Having clarity around these are all of the things that are on my plate. These are all of the things that I've got to take care of. So I'm going to give a little bit of margin. I'm going to give a little breathing room in setting those expectations. Not just because I want to underpromise and overdeliver, but so that I can actually take the time to assess what this thing is that you need from me and find a good path forward to get clarity on what that is. Because you cannot expect uh, your client to know what they're talking about. Right? Don't tell them I said that. But <laughs> how many times have they said, hey, can you make this happen really quickly? And in the back of your head, you're thinking, no, they're shaking you, right? Like, I mean, this is absolutely ridiculous. They don't know. That's why they're asking you. So being able to set those expectations with a little bit of margin allows you to take a step back, really think through, okay, what do we need to do here to be successful in this project? We had uh, recently a, a small project. It was a support request that came in, and it took us like a week to get a resolution to this thing. It was just taking way too long. Uh, and we were roadblock, a lot of internal communication stuff. And all that it really took by the time it came to my desk was sitting down with a couple of people who had worked on the project for maybe 15 minutes on the phone and saying, okay, this is what the client really wants. I know they're asking for this. This is the outcome that we want. We're trying to make this do this 15 different ways. They don't know. They don't care. Just get them to this place. And it just takes stepping back from it and having that space to get clarity on whatever that request is. Remember, you were hired to do this because they couldn't do it on their own. The last thing is keeping them actually involved, keeping them in the loop on what's going on. Now, having some kind of a response strategy is great, but it's always reactive. Taking you to the next step and adding that clarity in the relationship is being proactive. This can be as simple as just finding a way to send them your list of Git commits, right? So that they know you're working on it. Because that's really what they want to know. You're working on it. You're making progress. It can be a weekly report. It can be something as small as just a personal email, a touch base that's proactive that can mitigate so much mischief in a client's project by taking that extra little step in communication uh, and adding that extra little bit of clarity to it. So that brings us naturally to the second place where you find this shift in client relationship. Um, not, you start off with the expectations, that's the introduction, but then you end up with the actual client who can cause a lot of trouble. And I think anybody's had a client has uh, ran the, the gambit of this from, from one end to the other. But you can uh, pad yourself on the front end. Again, Trey mentioned accounting for all of the things. Um, and one thing is hosting. Hosting does make a difference. If you take on a client, uh, some of you or, or some developers decide that uh, they're going to take people on and host them in their own instances, or they're going to work with the host that somebody has already. Uh, regardless of which way you go, this is something that you need to take into account. Um, it's it, it, some, some hosts are better suited for different sites, because traffic is not the same thing as transactions. You have a WooCommerce site or somebody who is a lifestyle blogger that might have a whole lot of stuff that's mine. I'm, I'm terribly rude. My apologies. Um, <laughs> uh, but you have somebody that has uh, a, a different need, technically, and you want to make sure that, that you respond to that. We have a client who is a very uh, high traffic site, and he came to us with this host, and he wanted to stay on it, and we said, you know what, that's what we do. We're here to, to just help you. We're here to manage things to help make things easier for you. And his host was horrible, horrible. We would reach out and contact them uh, three and four times a week for silly things like just page resolving errors that would happen sporadically and randomly. There was no real reason or cause behind it, but we 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 knew it was the host. It took some convincing to get him to understand that, uh, but we, we moved that and, and finally convinced him. Okay, look, I'll send you up on a new host. Let's just see what it looks like. We convinced him to go, and we reduced our support tickets in regards to his hosting about seventy percent. It, it completely saved so much time on the back end because we took into account that it does make a difference. Um, the next thing, uh, it's just find a few good tools. I mean, everybody has their things that they prefer. Bitbucket, you know, some people like MigrateDB Pro. I mean, just whatever tools that you have in your toolbox, find them and, and stick to them. The, the idea is that you want to take these tools, not just because they're the best, but because you can create the best workflow for them. Have a process. Decide that you're going to start here. Create a checklist. I mean, you, you guys probably do the same things all the time. You know, you have this mental checklist that you run through, but write them down and add to that list and have a process and don't deviate from it. We create staging and development sites for our clients, and on the staging site, we have a process that we go through. You're going to upload this. You're going to push this. You're going to create this. And you, you create a, um, a, a very, uh, you create continuity so that everybody knows what everybody else is doing. You create, 
lessen the margin of error for something that might happen if you forget it. You didn't have your coffee in the back of the room whenever you got up in the morning. It's a bad day. You didn't have enough sleep or you're working late or something else is on your mind. You have a process and you stick to it. You're going to reduce that margin of error. Um, there are a lot of different things you can use. Uh, staging sites, development sites that have been extraordinarily helpful for us. People can check things out before you push them live. Um, a lot of people do that, uh, do uh, have their clients check things, but having a place where they can look at it and play with it and use it, aside from just look at it before you push it up, has been really helpful and people really appreciate it. Also, staging where they can play with it themselves. Some people, we have some clients that are very tech savvy and some that we probably wouldn't want to publish a post because it would cause a lot of trouble and make a lot of havoc. <laughs> But giving them some empowerment, a way to kind of go and look and play and touch and, and do their own thing while you're safely developing elsewhere can be, can be very beneficial. Um, again, Git, you mentioned uh, giving people updates. So it's so easy now to find a tool to push changes. It's so easy now to find a tool to log things, to track things. Having something that's searchable. Um, or, or findable if, if there's an issue and you can look back and say, no, 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 it wasn't me that logged in, that was your guy. Or saying, no, no, we changed this thing last week, did you revert some changes? Uh, so having, having tools, finding, finding a process, sticking to it, um, but, but also creating a record of what you've done is also very important. So the next area, especially if you're working on a remote team, as you get larger and larger projects, there's other people who are going to be at play, whether it's clients or sometimes you have multiple people who are the client on it. Uh, you have designers, you have developers, different people that you're working with. And there's a lot of room for kind of this internal uh, source of mischief, right? Uh, these things that are assumed that end up getting us in all kinds of trouble when we're working together, especially on a remote team. One of the things that for me was the biggest change coming from a you know physical environment to a remote team and remote environment, all of the communication has to be that much more clear. Uh, it forces you to be that much more explicit with everything that you're saying uh, to be able to communicate all of those subtle things that just naturally happen in person and at the water cooler and everything else. So uh, for us, there's a lot of tools that we like to use uh, for this uh, Slack or hip chat, some kind of uh, kind of area that you can break off different rooms that you can break off different areas for appropriate to have this conversation or that conversation. Um, we really like uh, Rike as a project management tool. We've been through a lot of those, uh, Trello, Asana, there's free ones, there's open source ones. Uh, but having some kind of place where you can comment on a ticket, comment on a change that needs to be made, uh, and then go back and search that. Go back and, you know, go back through Slack, go back through your PM software, uh, and say, this is why we made that decision, right? You wouldn't uh, write a new class or function without putting some kind of comment on what the heck it's supposed to do. Right? You're not going to make a business decision or talk about a client with something and then not record that somewhere so that you can go back and search and say, why did we choose that? Like, what was the deciding factor here? Being able to have that recorded clearly makes a huge, huge difference. Uh, another thing that we like to use is Google Hangouts for having uh, some kind of check-in point. It's really, really valuable for us and is that more human interaction when you're on a remote team, having that video chat is nice. Uh, the other thing, outside of just the tools that we use, are really clearly defining the roles. And this has been a huge process for us internally uh, at WP Ballet over this last year. We've uh, moved to kind of an organizational structure on Holacracy that forces really clear, specific roles for every little thing. And at some point it can seem overwhelming and just absolutely ridiculous how explicit you have to be and who's responsible for what and how often and what uh, you know regularity that we can expect certain things and what metrics we can track around that. But ha sitting down and having just even at the beginning of a project a conversation around, okay, now who is really responsible for what? Enforcing clarity, pushing clarity. Because you will find there are so many assumptions that you make within a team of, well, they're going to be the one to do that. And they should take care of that. And I, and I think they're going to do it this way. So having clarity around those roles is absolutely huge. Uh, and then the last but not least is actually having some kind of method or framework in, pr in place for how you check in, for how you force that conversation to happen. It's really easy to, uh, you know, especially on a remote team, I think part of the appeal to that is that you can just, you know, lock yourself away in your office and you don't have to talk to people. You can just do work all day. Like, that's so appealing. But having those regular human interactions and uh, touch points is key. For us, we've got a, uh, a morning scrum that we just kind of check in, do the three, you know, uh, scrum questions of what did you do yesterday, what are you working on today, do you have any roadblocks. 
uh, is a way for us to really quickly touch base. But even within that, uh, we have different smaller, you know, more project-focused teams that will meet once or twice a week on a very structured format. And I know for a lot of people, meetings is a dirty word. Nobody wants more meetings. Uh, you know, have you ever been in one of those meetings where you walk away from it and you wonder, why was I here? This wasted the last two hours of my life. You could have sent an email, and this would have just solved everything. Like, there was no need for meetings. So we, they get a bad rap. People can often hate meetings, but I don't think people really hate meetings. People hate unproductive meetings. People hate the feeling of walking away thinking, I could have done something better for the company, for my business, for whatever, with this time than sitting here listening to something that I'm not really a part of. So not only just having those check-in points, but making them structured, saying this is the reason why we're talking about this now, and here's the outcomes that we're going to have. Having takeaways at the end of every meeting. Everybody should walk away from a meeting with a clear next step of what they're going to do. So for us, that's been a complete boon to our just productivity and clarity and communication and cohesion as a remote team, having these structures uh, in place. And again, it's going to be different for you. It doesn't really matter that you follow this method or that method. What matters is having that in place, having that structure there to force clarity and to help you manage uh, that mischief. And the last place that we usually find mischief in a bounds uh, is in our own camp. You can cause your own mischief, Harry Potter. Right at home. Um, but a, a lot of times we do get our, and I'm not saying any of you are wrong because I know you're always right. Trust me, I'm always right. It's it's always it's always the fine. But sometimes there is there is a time when you do get in your own way, and there is a mistake that was made or something that was unclear. A lot of miscommunication and unintentional miscommunication. Um, nomenclature is a big problem whenever you start talking tech with clients. You know, what they think is flashy or bigger or scalable is not necessarily the same thing as what it means in tech. So sometimes you build something that's not quite what they wanted, but it's what you understood. So it's not wrong, but it's not necessarily what you should have put out. So uh, we've come into the situation ourselves a few times where people have asked for things and we've gone on wild goose chases looking for um, fonts or spacing issues or trying to debug plugins when really all they wanted was just maybe an extra you know, frame at the bottom of the newsletter. So overthinking a situation can, can cause a lot of trouble. Um, whenever something does happen, regardless of who's responsible, Humility and honesty is the best way to diffuse any situation with a client. Whether you're wrong or you're right, you don't necessarily have to say you're right. You can just say, you know what, yeah, that sucks. And that just diffuses a lot of tension because you agree, it does suck. It sucks for you, it sucks for them, it sucks for everybody. So, you know, I, I would love to help you fix it. You know, I, that's, that's, you don't need to grovel on the floor and say, please hire me to fix it again, or I need another you know, hour of time to do it. No, I would love to help you fix it, and it sucks. You don't necessarily have to have to, to lay on the floor and model in tears. Um, but offer to repair the damage, but offer to do it correctly. There needs to be some uh, re-clarification. It's not necessarily uh, a reparation process. You know, I've hurt you, I'm going to fix this for you. No. Let's figure out what it was, what went wrong. Let's get some clarity around it, and we'll fix it, and we're going to fix it the right way. Now, oftentimes, uh, there is uh, an issue where you had the right idea, and then the client maybe changed their mind, or the issue changed, or what they thought they wanted wasn't really what they had gotten. Um, that's, you still need to stick to your guns in situations like that. Uh, but, and then there are times where uh, you make a commitment. We recently had a client who made a commitment to help out. We've been going through the process of getting to know them for a few months, and they do a really short fire sale um, during, uh, during the year, and this is their giant money-making time, lots and lots of traffic, uh, and, and we thought, okay, well, you know, this guy seems tech-savvy enough, you know, we're here to support you at whatever level of tech you need, second level or otherwise, um, so let's let's go forward, let's see, let's be successful, we're going to try to help you. We'll come to the end of the sale, and all of the interaction that we had, we discovered that the things under the hood weren't as well, uh, as well structured as promised, or well structured as told upon first place. So we ended up in a situation where we had to, to kind of go back and say, look, you know, he, he was very upset that we hadn't done one or two things, and he started asking us to hack plugins and, you know, kind of change some code here and there. We're like, whoa, that's not what we do. This is not right. This is not going to be sustainable. You're going to update a plugin, the whole site's going to crash, or you're going to put this JS in here, and the things are going to stop appearing on other pages. You can't, you know, you're, he had so many affiliate plugins. and I mean, it was, it was insane the amount of work that this site was doing. It was done 
it was performing, which was amazing, and what he had built was great. But at the same time, we have to come back and say, look, we can't support what you built because we know that it can be better. We know it needs to be better, and what you have isn't going to stand much longer, especially if you plan to scale and grow. Because that was his that was his next goal. We talked to him. What do you want to do? Oh, well, I want to replicate this. I want to do this two and three times a year with different types of products. It's not going to work if you keep it this way. And you bring it to them, and we had a fairly hefty price tag. Fairly hefty, because there was so much. The design would be the same, but it just takes a lot of work to rebuild e-commerce. And especially as customized as he had it, and, and he kept pushing back. Well, it works fine. Well-ish. No, it doesn't. But you, you have to stick to your guns and, and want to do it right. Um, it's don't don't compromise what you know to be correct uh, for the sake of just making someone happier. Oh, I'm gonna do it this once. You know, you've gotta. If we don't all stick to creating a culture of best practice, then it's it's all gonna fall apart. And then the expectations get skewed across the board for everybody that starts to develop a lunch and work um, The last thing is just be willing to let it go. Make like Elsa. Let it go. You, not everybody's a good fit. You're not always going to have a client that's always going to want to work with you, want to work the way that you want to work. If you feel some tension, don't feel the pressure to keep them. Just let it go. They might know some. You might know somebody else that would be better for them. So you, you're not always going to make it work, and that's okay. You have to be willing to just to just let it go by. Yeah. So uh, I think we'll take a time to open it up for questions. If anybody's still awake. Yeah, or to open it up for somebody to get me some coffee. Yeah. <laughs> so, we are Kim and Trey from WPLA. If you want to contact us at all, you have any questions, you want to find out more about our agency, you can email us at solutions.wpla.com. And we are on Twitter, WPLA. We are a little so don't really tweet much, so. It's yeah, yeah, we're too busy working. Conference time comes around, and the Twitter uh, Twitter account's live enough, but um, we'll be on that. Yeah. Thank you.